Good evening, everyone. Wow. It doesn't take much to get a round of applause when David Blight is in the room. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, I just can't tell you how excited I am to welcome all of you to see such a nice turnout of, of students, especially because I'm told the flu is going around at Washington College. Um, and so like half the students in my class are out today. So those of you who are not Washington College students, please hold your breath until you've left campus. Um, no, seriously, we're, we're all healthy here. We're, um, no, really though, um, it's, a, it's a tremendous, tremendous pleasure and honor to welcome David Blight um, back to Washington College. This is his fourth visit as far as um, we can count um, over the past two decades. And in fact, David was actually one of the very first visiting speakers that the Star Center ever hosted after its founding before I got here back in 2001. Perhaps a few of you um, were even here. I, I know that um, our freshmen, however, did not attend because they were busy being born in 2001. <laughs> so um, it's, been, it's been a little while. But on that long ago occasion, David spoke, I'm told, about his newly published book, Race and Reunion, which was about racial divisions and the memory and legacy of the Civil War. That book has since gone on to become a classic of American history. In fact, the students in my History 111 class are reading it right now in our, in our course. And I would say that of the many, many, many books that are published on the Civil War, they say that on average, there's been more than one book published on the Civil War every day since the surrender at Appomattox. <laughs> so it's a big field. It's a big field. And I would say that um, of the past at least generation, it's hard to think of a book that's been more influential in how scholars understand and, and turn the rest of us uh, understand the Civil War than race and reunion. I have no doubt that this book that we're learning about tonight will go on to become a classic as well. So David actually also is one of those writers on history who truly makes history himself. And to give you an example of that, again back to this um, event in 2001, I'm told that during the lively Q&A exchange after the program, someone in the audience mentioned an old derelict building here in Chestertown, right down on Queen Street that had reputedly, according to oral tradition, been a lodge for African-American Civil War veterans, but at that point was in imminent danger of demolition by the slumlord who owned it. Um, conversation got started that David Blight participated in, and as a direct result of that public conversation, a diverse group of citizens got together. People started researching the history of this old building, including some Washington College students and faculty. Um, they saved it from destruction. It was acquired by a local nonprofit, um, and it is now our beloved Sumner Hall, a dynamic community organization and one of the great historic treasures of Maryland. David, for your part in that, thank you. And all of you are looking around the room and, and seeing many, many people um, who have participated in and continue to participate in that, in that great work. Tonight, we welcome David back to Chestertown in the glow of yet another triumph, this magnificent new biography, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. I'm sure most of you have seen the accolades. It was named one of the top 10 books of 2018 by the New York Times, Time Magazine, and others. The Times called it a tour de force of storytelling. The New Yorker called it a great American biography, and I think the Washington Post reviewer might have been even more impressed, if that's possible. I'll be very surprised if this book doesn't win some major awards in the months ahead. In addition to his other laurels, David Blight is class of 1954 professor of history emerit, I'm sorry, professor of history, not emeritus, <laughs> um, and at, at Yale University. Sorry, no, please, please don't, don't go anywhere. Um, he's professor of, uh, of history at, at Yale University, and he's director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Re Resistance, and Abolition, which explores the history of slavery and emancipation, not just in the United States, but around the world, including those countries in our own time um, where the crime of slavery persists today. He's the author of many award-winning books and the recipient of many prizes, including Last February, Washington College's own Award of Excellence, which he accepted right here 
on this stage as part of a ceremony where Frederick Douglass was also bestowed posthumously with an honorary degree from Washington College. This evening, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors in the Department of History and the American Studies program, as well as the many other colleagues and friends uh, on campus and beyond campus who helped make this occasion happen. David will join me on stage in just a moment. Um, I'll ask him questions about the book and he'll answer them for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A from all of you, and who knows, maybe in this Q&A some more historic buildings will be saved. Um, we'll look forward to that. Um, and after the, after the event, David will be out in the, in the lobby signing books until his hand falls off, which I have a feeling that it may, because Shannon, our wonderful um, bookseller, says that there are a lot of people who are going to be lining up to buy, to buy books, so you're, you're warned, David. But um, we're very happy that he's uh, willing to do that um, for folks who want to get their books signed. And as usual, Washington College students will be able to purchase those books for half price with the other half um, subsidized by the Star Center. Um, so welcome everyone, and please join me in welcoming David White. gone through to probe back into that childhood memory, um, which begins largely at the White House. Uh, he remembers the Tuckahoe, he remembers Betsy Bailey's cabin, but his, his, his rich childhood memories begin at Watts. And, in Talbot County. And in, in all over Talbot County, uh, all of, you know, through Colby's Farm, and St. Michael's, Colby's Farm, yep. Freeland's Farm, Easton, and the rest. Um, so it's, it's clearly ambivalent because there's so much pain in that memory. Uh, on the other hand, it's where he's from. Yeah. And throughout his life, there's so many manifestations of this, of him always bringing up or alluding to where he's from. Um, sometimes he's quite explicit about it. You know, how did a boy from the Tuckahoe end up where I am? might have been in the Great Hall in Edinburgh, or it might have been in uh, the White House, or it might have been in, uh, you name the place, he spoke there. Uh, sometimes he might have been thinking, how did a boy from the Tucko end up out here in the 
godforsaken town in Iowa giving yet another talk and yet another <laughs> church. You know, what day is it and why am I here? How much am I getting paid? Yeah, or, yeah and are they going to give me the 150 yeah. bucks they promised so I can get back home? But I'll just say one other thing about that. When I was doing the early chapters, which are, you know, this late year, and especially those, those first few, the, the Eastern Shore years of his youth, and the teenage years, I, you have to rely on the autobiographies a lot, but you, there are also now rich sources here on the Eastern Shore. Some of the people who helped me with those sources are here tonight. Uh, if I start naming them, I'll forget others. Um, but I found myself going to the library at Yale and checking out books on, believe it or not, child psychology. I want, and, and I don't, to this day, know how it helped me. I'm not even sure if it did. But I wanted to try to understand, how do we remember childhood? How do we construct those memories of our youth? Whenever it starts, we may have first memories from three years old, four or five years old, and then six, seven, eight years old. How do we remember that? Well, we know from memory, cognitive memory science that we remember by association. We remember by episode. We remember also because of trauma. Uh, you know, the most visceral traumatic memories tend to stick in some way. And if you've read the narrative, or Bondage and Freedom, second autobiography, which is much richer, much deeper, there are more mature writers there. You've got to get beyond just the narrative. You've got to read the second autobiography. That's what I'm always telling my students after I assign them the narrative. <laughs> But he does write about many episodes of violence, uh, brutality, beatings, uh, even you know, the killing of Denby. Um, and he writes a lot about fear, humiliation. He's trying to construct that memory. At the same time, you will find a certain degree of loving memory. Standing beneath Lucretia Hall's window, singing for her because she would give him morsels of food. And once finally- This is his mistress in Baltimore. Well, no, no, this is our- this Oh, this is here on the- Yeah, this is, yeah. A, this is at the White House. Yeah, right. Um, that's when he was the captain. Yes, and he, Lucretia even invited him into the parlor one day. He, he got into a scrape and she fixed his little wound on his forehead or something. So, you know, it, it is a childhood. He's remembering a childhood, but a childhood full of it as he put it, extremes, and extremes of trauma. So he couldn't have possibly had anything other than ambivalence about the Eastern Shore. However, as you well know, he came back many times after the war, famously, usually with paparazzi in tow, or equivalent of paparazzi in tow. And thank, thank God the press did follow him, because we learned a lot more about him. His visit, that first visit in 1877, where he comes to St. Michael's, and then he comes to East, and he speaks in the churches, and, and then he goes out, <coughs> from God, he goes out to the bend in the Tuckahoe, or he, he goes to find the place where his grandmother's cabin was. He even remembers, I think it's a cedar tree, that he thought would be there, and then there was the ravine down to the river, and he gets on his hands and knees, digs up hands full, handfuls of soil, puts it in a sack or a bag or something, and takes it back to Cedar Hill in Washington. There he is, trying to do what? Understand, where am I from? Who am I? How did, how did, I, how did I become me? How did I get from here to there? By the way, I once asked a curator of Cedar Hill, you don't have a bag of dirt here, do you? <laughs> and this was the house where he lived as an old man. Yeah, in Washington, and they said, no. <laughs> I told that story, and I, it was Kamal McLaren, who's a brilliant curator there. And he said, yeah, I know that story, but we never found that bag of dirt. <laughs> Too bad, I wanted a piece of the dirt. <laughs> anyway. Well, so many questions, but you know, when you talk about him returning home, of course there was that great mystery of his life, which was who was his father where I, I don't I got the sense sometimes that he both wanted to know and didn't want to know the answer to that yeah. question. But I and I so I wonder what you think of that, but I also wonder, you know, in an age of DNA, is there any way that did you think about trying to find Douglas's father through 
beginning. I have not thought that much about that, but I know people who have, yeah. and there are people as we speak. Well, namely Skip Gates at Harvard, is very, who has the PBS program Finding Your Roots, does DNA testing on celebrities, etc. Skip is very interested in trying to find all descendants, and Anthony, there are more all descendants, I believe, than there are Anthony descendants, but I'm saying that in the wrong place. I was just glad nobody had done any serious DNA testing before I got the book done. Because, <laughs> seriously, because if Douglas didn't know, I didn't want to know. I wanted to keep it in historical time. You know, the two best yeah. candidates are, of course, Aaron Anthony and Tom Saul. Yeah. But he never, he never knew. His two I masters, think he did. Yeah, his two masters, two owners. Um, I think he did want to know. I mean, he, he goes to all deathbed there in St. Michael in 1977, and in effect asked him. He also became fairly close friends with Amanda and Benjamin Hall, Hall's son and daughter, who had correspondence with him. He, he writes to Benjamin Hall very late at 1893 or 94, that's a Benjamin Hall letter, where he writes, and even, he's still asking Benjamin Hall, do, do, you, have, do you know what my birthday was? Did you, did you ever hear, do you know? Uh, dancing around the real question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah indeed. Uh, uh, am I your half brother? <laughs> he didn't quite ask it that way. But there is that primal, primal desire to know who's my father, but also who are my other kinfolk. Yeah. Uh, and that would be pretty extensive. And of course, then there's, there's his black kinfolk that he only got to know with time. He barely knew the siblings. Here, uh, he, he has that incredible passage in the narrative where he says, "You know, he dropped off there by his grandmother at the wine plantation, and he's he's told these are your brothers and sisters. He didn't know him, didn't know who they were. And later on, he, <laughs> his siblings find him, uh, and he knows them a little, but not much. So the, he had reunions with his black siblings." <coughs> So, you know, there's so many kinds of miracles in Douglas's life, it seems like, and one of them is that he comes out of this kind of nowhere mm -hmm. spot, this mm -hmm. remote spot from total obscurity, from not, yeah. um, no, barely, not knowing who his father was, barely spending any time with his mother. Um, and then, almost overnight, it seems like he becomes a celebrity. Yeah. And you capture that moment so beautifully, and you found some new information, too, I think, about how he came, sort of that, that pivotal moment where he escapes from mm -hmm. slavery mm -hmm. and he then suddenly becomes a celebrity. And I wonder if you could mm -hmm. kind of narrate for, for us how that happened exactly. Well, you're referring to then the move to New Bedford yeah, and exactly. then the abolition. And he's just kind here. of like like a star. Yeah. Kind of this yeah. Well, it wasn't overnight, as you know. And this is where Maryland, especially Baltimore, had everything to do. Douglas became Douglas. Without Baltimore, we wouldn't have known him. I mean, his odds of getting, yeah. although Harriet Tubman and James Pennington and a few others got out of the Eastern Shore without Baltimore, <laughs> but it was Baltimore that made Douglas popular. It's Baltimore where he gained his literacy. Although I have a little theory that he even got the very beginnings of his literacy there at the White House. Daniel Lloyd, because he used to wait outside that door where the gentleman showed me where the, the, the school was conducted, on the left side of the house if you're in front of it, and Douglas tells us he would stand outside that door, and when Daniel came out of school, this is the son of the master of the yeah, plantation, and he's barely six yeah. years old, he'd ask him, what'd you learn today? And I don't know what the answer was. Probably, let's go to the woods, I don't know, what, is, what do kids say? But it's Baltimore where he gains his literacy. It's Baltimore where he discovers the Columbian order, that orator, that magical book that, that is transforming him for him. It's Baltimore where he encounters Charles Lawson, whom he calls father or uncle Lawson, this dreaming by day, uh, fanatical Bible reader by night who latches on to this early teenager who can read so well. 
hours and hours and hours and we could read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, out loud in Baltimore, where he, he got involved with four different churches, two largely white churches, two largely black churches, he names all four ministers, he tells you what he liked and didn't like about all those ministers, just like we do about our ministers. And, and he, he got involved for a while in a debating society, et cetera, et cetera. He got engaged with the huge free black population of Baltimore. The year he escaped in 38, Baltimore had about 130,000 people. A huge ocean port city, as you know. Great shipbuilding city. It had th about 3,000 slaves, but it had 17,000 free blacks. Free blacks were the dominant black community, and they had a they, they had their own kind of economy. They had their own cultural life. That's where Douglass's literacy kicks in. He doesn't walk out of slavery a born orator, but he has practiced that oratory. He certainly doesn't walk out of slavery a born writer. In fact, he's not a writer. Star is born uh, when the Garrisonians discover him supposedly. That one faction of the abolitionist movement. Right. Yeah. William Lloyd Garrison, <laughs> Massachusetts Anti Slavery Society out of Boston, discovered him preaching at the AME Zion Church in, uh, in New Bedford. But that's key. And he's just a sort of a manual laborer. That's he's a manual laborer. He worked with his hands, did all kinds of jobs down at the docks, uh, uh, all kinds of jobs, whatever he could find. To, put food on the table for the growing family. But within his first year in New Bedford, he's only 21 years old, he gets involved with the, the little local AME Zion. And before long, they somehow realize this kid can preach. And there he was in the pulpit, learning to preach to the text, which is, of course, the Protestant tradition. He's preaching to the text, not every Sunday, but some Sundays. That's where he practices his craft oratory or sermon. And that's where his first discovery. He also spoke, though, at a couple other gatherings there in New Bedford. He's 21, 22, and then 23 when the Garrisonians invite him out to Nantucket. And even then, though, he's not a, he's kind of a fully formed orator. He, he learns his craft. Um, but at Nantucket, he gave his first speech to white people. Tells us that he shook in his shoes at Birdsville, just uh, and basically he just starts telling his story, telling his Eastern Shore story, telling his Baltimore story, telling his stories that then he will, five years later, sit down, four years later, sit down and sort of put into narrative form in the first autobiography. But it is clear from from the beginning of his lecturing career, which starts then in the autumn of 1841. They invite him to go out on the road, first just in New England. His first lecture trip was up into New Hampshire, and then all over Massachusetts. And he's in physical danger all, all, all the time. time. Yeah. I mean, there was there were no security. He usually traveled in groups. They traveled in troops, two, three, four, five abolitionists traveled together. They stayed wherever they could get lodging. Uh, <laughs> they and by the way, in, in, in writing those early years of him out on circuit, I got, I suddenly realized I had to get interested in 19th century travel. Mm -hmm. And I do say in the book, those who read it know, that Douglas may have been the most traveled American of the 19th century. As well as the most photographed, right? Definitely, well, they say now the most photographed. And I can't prove, you know, we, we have no way of measuring the miles he traveled, although I did a lot of estimates. You could watch it too, as he would do, three and four thousand miles at a the only American who may have traveled more miles than Douglas would probably be Mark Twain. But Twain cheated because he went to Asia. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas only went to Egypt. He went to Egypt and Greece. Yeah. But, but, but um, the ubiquity of this travel in the 1840s is just, we, we complain about travel. I just took Amtrak down here. <laughs> it was nice. It was fine. It was on time. No, I, I've been I've been oh. writing about Clara Barton on the like oh, circuit around oh, the same time. Oh. There was one time when literally the um, train like fell. It was in a blizzard. The train falls over. <laughs> the Colburn.
burning stove falls on top of her, singes her, destroys her clothing, and she insists on getting carried through the blizzard to the next stop where she gives her lecture. <laughs> Go Clara! She was, yeah, I mean, woo, Frederick Douglass was tough, so was she. But stagecoaches. Yeah, it was, oh, yeah. Oh, man. But, you know, speaking of, speaking of, of that, the stories that you tell about Frederick Douglass and women are so interesting, both Douglass as, a, as an early feminist mm -hmm. in such impressive ways, and also the women in his life were so influential and important, and could you, could you talk, I'm sure, I'm sure you could talk about them all night, but could you tell us a little bit? Well, we need an hour for this one, but yeah. let's, let's go there. Yes, uh, well, you know, that one of Douglass's most famous speeches, especially after the Civil War, is a speech called Self-Made Man. Uh, which is a much better speech than it sometimes is given the credit for. It's a remarkable speech. But he wasn't as self-made as either he portrayed himself or we sometimes portray him. And it was the women in his life who had so much to do with, I think, the fact that he wasn't as self-made as we might think. It begins with his grandmother Betsy, his mother Harriet, whom he hardly knew. Uh, other women along the way, well, he's still a slave. And there's Anna, Anna Murray, whom he meets in Baltimore, free black woman who was born right out on the other side of, of the Tuckahoe, about three miles from where Frederick was born. She was born. She's about three years older. They probably played at that same mill when they were kids. I mean, I don't have any evidence for that, but all the kids in that area, what's that mill called by the time? Wine mill? Yeah, sure. I can't remember what that is. When in doubt, call it a Y here. Yeah, right, <laughs> right here. Yeah. But anyway, he meets Anna Murray, the free black woman who works as a domestic, had a good gig, so to speak, um, who was his wife of 44 years after the two escaped living. And by the way, she has the same bravery he did to escape out of Baltimore, took all the same risks he did after he escaped. Did they make him a feminist, those women? God, that's a good question. He's a feminist about political rights and even economic rights. Certainly by the time he goes to speak at Seneca Falls in 1848, he's the only male speaker at the Seneca Falls Convention up in upstate New York in 1848, which is only about six months after he's just founded his newspaper, The North Star, which, by the way, right after the Seneca Falls Convention, he changed the masthead to right is of no color or sex. He even, he even supported uh, black, econo uh, black women, no. <laughs> women's economic rights uh, in New York State in the 1850s. There were bills before the state legislature to give women the rights after divorce to property, to give them uh, rights to their own economic liberty, that is to own property when they were married. The, the laws were if you're married, give all the property to your husband, et cetera. Now, the complication there, though, of course, with Anna, and there's other places to go here, is that Anna, as everyone probably knows, remained largely a non-reader, non-writer the rest of her life. The reasons for that are not known, despite everyone having their own theories. It could have been dyslexia, could have been resistance to his work, could have been who knows many attempts to get her tutors, they did have tutors, various people were her tutors, including her own daughter, Rosetta. But Anna was a thoroughgoing domestic woman, never traveled with Douglas, almost never. The only time I have of, of Anna really traveling with Frederick on the road, well, there were a couple, but one in particular, was when her two sons were in the 54th Massachusetts, drilling at Fort Meade in Boston, uh, about to go off to war. That famous Glory Regiment. Yes, yeah. yes, the Glory Regiment. She, with her daughter Rosetta, went over to Boston, stayed three days just to be near her sons before they went to war. Douglas traveled all the time. The itinerant lecture, an abolitionist organizer, Anna, did not travel. You have that lovely image of her always standing on the railway platform. Well, she would meet him at train stations uh, and give him what they called clean linen, which meant underwear and shirts. And off he'd 
go again. Because the livelihood of the family was Douglas was a newspaper, which was not a growth industry, and his lecturing and his writing. In fact, from 1847, when he comes back from England, to 1877, when he gets his first federal appointment as Marshal of the District of Columbia, he never made a dime in his life any other way than with his voice or his pen, except for the patrons he had in England. There were several people in England who did raise money to support his newspaper. Without this, that paper probably would have failed. His voice and his pen were the only livelihood that the family eventually of five children had. And uh, I, I wouldn't, I can't say Anna made him a feminist, uh, but he was a he was a believer in, in what the woke people call intersectionality, right? Oh God, yeah, that word would have driven him as crazy as <laughs> right. That's an academic word that we should uh, sure. reserve there. Well, that's another. Well, there are nicer right. words, better words but, for that. But yeah. yeah, but I don't, but, but I'll tell you, who, there were many many other women who who made him a feminist yeah. because he learned how to value women's minds. Mm -hmm. He learned how to value their work. He's out on the circuit in 1841 and 42 with Abby Kelly. Yeah. And Abby Kelly was a dynamo. Oh, Abby, was Douglas was second billing that first year. Well, into the second year, he's kind of becoming the first billing. Uh, but Abby Kelly was. was she would like, preach for like 48 hours oh, non stop. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 They would travel in troops. And it would come see Abby Kelly. And then there's this guy Douglas opening for Abby Kelly. And he did openings for Abby Kelly until. Abby Kelly did all this for him. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's so much. And many other women abolitionists have been yeah. kind of influenced by him. There's so much to cover with his life, and I want to make sure that we, we cover at least a couple of other points in this sure. panorama. Um, so the Civil War, I have to ask you about. He was really, I mean, not, not everybody thinks of him as a Civil War hero. I think Douglas maybe is one of those people who's more honored than understood. And I think the image of him in the mind well put. that's sort of there is He's the slave who escaped on the Underground Railroad, became an abolitionist, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's it. But, yeah. but you really do such a masterful job of bringing up the whole rest of his life, the majority of his life, really, and, and starting with, can you talk about him as a Civil War hero? And in, in my opinion, the guy really did as much to win the Civil War for the Union as just about anybody uh, who commanded the Union Army. Well, if it's at all true that the word or the voice can be as powerful as sword. I mean, we'd like to believe that, wouldn't we? Uh, Douglas is our prototype. Uh, did he win the war with words? No. I think Grant's army has something to do with that. Yeah, a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> um, yes, heroic in the sense, in several ways. One of the things that was after all these years of living with Douglas, as, you know, when you do biography, as you know, there's some things you never can quite know. You just can't get there. Some have the evidence, you just can't quite know it. Then there's your list of things you do know. Uh, among the things I do know is this guy had an almost super, superhuman endurance of oppression, disappointment, frustration, hopelessness. We know what's coming in history. Obviously, no one experiencing that history knows what's coming. But to, to live through the 1850s, the, the terror and fear of the 1850s, the, the, to, to be as he was, one who wished for a conflict, wished for a breakup of the Union of some kind. He didn't exactly predict it all. But he wanted some kind of breakup America that would cause an opening that might then cause some kind of sanctioned conflict that then would be a sanctioned war on slavery was his fondest dream. And then when it comes, he becomes a sometimes not so admirable thump war propagandist. In fact, I think he's one of the, I have a whole chapter on this in the book, the kindling spirit of his battle cry, which is that phrase out of the Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem. Douglas created the hated enemy of the Union cause. He's saying, let's slaughter, let's murder. Slaughter slaveholders. Slaughter. Mm -hmm. 
unequivocal. It's as bad as the, his, his rhetoric in the war is, is brutal sometimes. The, the war propaganda you may have read about in World War I, World War II, so on. However, it's the endurance uh, of this cause and, it, and the endurance he had to never give up on the basic creeds of America. To him, you know, the, the birthright creeds of America didn't belong to just America. They were natural rights. They were like iron ore out of the ground. They were like the air you breathe. Um, they were the water you subsist in. Uh, they weren't just American. They had, an, they had a peculiar American history. They weren't just American. So in the war, he's, of course, a ferocious critic of Lincoln and Lincoln's administration for the first year, year and a half of the war. I mean, Lincoln had no more bitter critic in many ways than Douglas. And he almost gave up and went to Haiti. He almost, he actually booked passage with his daughter Rosetta, who was about 19 then, I think, to go have a look at Haiti in April, late April, 61. 61. He'd booked a ship and then came Fort Sumter, and there's this little a column in his newspaper that says, trip to Haiti canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Something happened last week. Felt the firing on Fort Sumter, outbreak of civil war. I think I'll stay. Uh, but then, of course, with the preliminary proclamation, the final proclamation, and especially the commitment to recruit, recruitment of black troops, <coughs> Douglas's tune on Link, not only Lincoln, but Douglas's tune on the prospect of the conflict changed, changed markedly. Doesn't mean he's not going to still be deeply frustrated in 1863 and 64 at times. But I'll give you one quick example here. After the final proclamation is signed, over in Boston on Emancipation Night, incredible celebration in Tremont Temple, which he writes about so beautifully. And I'm milked for all it's worth. <laughs> goes back to Rochester. And here's one other thing I know about Douglas. Biographers shouldn't say they know that too many times. But Douglas was one of those people that didn't always know what he thought until he could write it down. He was a writer. And by the way, every major speech, all the great speeches, the major speeches of his life, we have text of all of them. They were written. He wasn't just the guy who would walk into a hall and blow out the light you know, off the top of his head with a sermon. He could do that too if he wanted to. But he wrote out his speeches. He goes back to Rochester, first week of January of 63. He first publishes that little editorial that he'd already written before he went to Boston called A Day for Poetry and meaning Emancipation Day. Then he sat down and wrote a new speech, because he's going on the road now. And he surely did all over the Midwest. And the title of that speech was The Proclamation on the Negro Army. And in that speech, among other and it, th that speech became the prototype for all the speeches he'll then use spring and summer of 63 to recruit black troops. But in that speech, among other things, he says, this proclamation has, has freed us all. It has freed the white Confederate soldier. It has freed the white Union soldier. It has freed the black slave. It has freed now possibly black soldiers. And it has freed the country. His interpretation of the Emancipation Proclamation is like his interpretation of the whole war. It has the potential to destroy the first United States and reinvent the second. That took endurance. That took, well, it took a certain brilliance, which his particular brilliance of words and language to fashion that phrasing that he was always coming up with. Um, of course, that recruiting of black troops will become very, very frustrating that summer when he learns about all the discrimination. Yeah, my, my students and I, in, in my History 111 class, have been talking about this concept of reconstruction. Mm. And how just sort of literally as a metaphor, if you talk about reconstructing a building, mm -hmm. like, you know, if this yeah. building, God forbid, burned down tomorrow and Washington College went to reconstruct this building, they could either, okay, we're going to put every piece <laughs> back together the way that it was mm -hmm. to look exactly the same, or we're going to reconstruct yeah. um, Gibson as something totally new. The word can mean both things, and so we're talking about both, kind of what was going on. And, and so one of my students today actually came up with a lovely metaphor I thought when we were talking about Lincoln and looking at the Gettysburg Address, and mm -hmm. he said, Lincoln um, wants
wanted to build a new building but using some of the same materials. Mm. And I really like that. Do you think that works? That's very clever if, if that student's here. Way to go. He is here, I thought, <laughs> hey. by the way. Cool. Uh, so, I mean, do you think that, that just what Douglas was trying to do, too? No. No. Douglas <laughs> wanted to. You wanted the whole thing. Well, Douglas wanted new materials. Yeah. He wanted new participants. He wanted a bigger yeah. cast yeah. in the construction crew. Let's play this metaphor out. I liked it. Okay. Um, he doesn't want the union restored. He doesn't want the building restored. He wants it truly redesigned. Mm -hmm. And of course, so did most of the radical Republicans. I think that's what my student was saying. To be sure. Fair. He wanted it. And yeah. actually, but, and Lincoln came there too. You know your Lincoln better than I do. Uh, at least by the end of. War, Lincoln understands this isn't going to be a restoration. Although we don't know where Lincoln is going with his instruction because he's not there. Um, but he already is speaking at least of the idea of some black suffrage and voting, some elements of equality. Uh, and in the second inaugural, Lincoln clearly has a sense that the first. Douglas's conception, it's great that you asked this, Douglas's conception of the coming of the Civil War, the fighting of it, and its meaning, and it doesn't mean he had predicted all this, doesn't make him you know, the, the perfect prophet. But I did use the word prophet in the title of this book, and I'm happy to defend that. He saw the American Civil War, and so did millions of other Americans from both sides. In biblical terms, in Old Testament terms, this was the destruction of the temple, uh, the temple of Jerusalem, the temple of Washington. This was the destruction of a poison, corrupt, slaveholding America, 80 some years into its existence. Predicted, if you like, by abolitionists for 40 years, predicted for two, three, two and a half millennia by the Hebrew prophets. The temple must be destroyed, it has to be destroyed, in order to ever recreate it. And, you know, Exodus doesn't play out perfectly. No great ancient story ever plays, no parallel from the past ever plays out perfectly. But Douglas came to see the American Civil War through the template of the story of Exodus, of the story of the Hebrew prophets temple will be destroyed. Some of the people will survive. Some of them will end up in an Egyptian bondage. Some of them will get to Sinai and get the law from Moses. Some of them will go into the Babylonian captivity, whether it lasts for 40 years or 60 or 80, depends on who you read. And a lot of those will become Babylonians uh, and totally lost. But a few of them will be with Joshua back in the promised land if they endure. If they endure. If they keep the faith if they know what their creeds are, if they don't lose hold of the original faith, the original creed. Now, I think that's in part why Douglas could keep some, some kind of faith uh, at all. Uh, although he all but lost that faith in America at various stages of this story, particularly at the time. And the things he said could be devastating oh, about America. Oh, Completely devastating. When he comes back from England, he's, oh Lord. I want to tear up the Constitution. I want to tear up, yeah. Oh, he says, when he returned from England in 1847, we're going back here, but he has just, he's still a very young man, 27, 28 years old. But he's just spent 18 months in Ireland, Scotland, and England where they lionized him. He was, he was a hero. He was treated with very, very little racism. I mean, hardly ever. Unlike America, where he's encountered it every day if he's in the public. And when he comes back, um, there was one newspaper reporter who saw him speak in that first month he's back, and he called him the demagogue in black. And when I read that, I thought, chapter title. <laughs> <laughs> That's how, you know, when you're writing, and ooh, I can use that. But Douglas came back saying, I have no country. 
My country disowns me. My country hates me. I hate it back. I have no flag. I have no nation. I have no country. My country is a slaveholding, corrupt, doomed structure. Whew. And Wendell Phillips, great abolitionist at one point, writes a letter to Douglas and says, Fred, tone it down. <laughs> yeah, come on. And well, Phillips was a pretty radical word. Can you tone it down? Man? People think you're crazy. He also got on him about his uh, fake British accent. <laughs> <laughs> hate that. Yeah. Yeah. Always in the way. Young um, people go to England yeah. and uh, they come back uh, <laughs> saying the label. Well, and all well that. so I, your book left me with about a half a million questions I wanted to ask. I wrote about um, six dozen of them down. I'm going to make my way through all of them methodically. Good. No, actually, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I have one more question I really want to ask you, but I think I will save it, actually, because I want to give other people, maybe I'll come back to it if there's time at the end of, of this okay. Q&A. Um, so let's start working our way through questions from the audience and, and try to cover as many as we as we can, because we don't have a ton of time you left. You lived a long time, all the way to 1890. Okay, great. Um, we like to ask a question to, uh, I'll call on people. So you do that. Because I, I want to find a student who has a question, which we traditionally try to do, and I think, is that Lori all the way in the... Mm. Mm. Did people hear that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the ambiguous problem of Maryland. <laughs> In the Union, but not. Uh, terribly divided, as you know. And all these guesses. The 60-40 divide in Maryland, uh, you probably know. Uh, no, I don't know anywhere where Douglas explicitly complained about the way because since Maryland had not seceded from the Union, technically the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply. It was only in the states in rebellion where the actual proclamation applied. However, uh, he was certainly aware of the fact lots of slaves were escaping all over Maryland. In Maryland, out of Maryland, um, et cetera. But what is very interesting is Douglas took a deep interest by 64 when the state of Maryland, on November 1st, 1864, the week before the presidential election, Maryland held a referendum to decide whether to be a free state before the war ever ended. And the referendum came out just slightly, the vote was yes, it was very close, within like three or 400 votes. Yeah, maybe you didn't want to know that. Maybe you already did. Well, you, you don't want to know how Kent County voted. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh, well. And then he gave that great speech yeah. uh, when he came back. Oh, yeah. God, yes. But when he found out that Maryland had just voted to be a free state, he announced, I'm going back to Baltimore. And the week after the presidential election, where Lincoln wins re-election, he went back to Baltimore. He spoke in the AME church on Dallas Street in Fells Point, one of the churches he'd been involved in uh, in his slave teenage years, and uh, gave an incredible speech. He also, and he celebrated that uh, Maryland was now free soil. And he waxed on about, he changed the, all the metaphors about Maryland. Maryland was these beautiful hills and the <laughs> And this rich soil, and, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. yeah, it was no longer the dirty, sandy backwater of you know, the Eastern Shore. Uh, and well, I, I, don't, I won't play out the whole speech, but it's also at that moment he encountered his sister Eliza, who lived all the way down in uh, uh, the lower county of the Eastern Shore, Dorchester. She she had traveled all the way up to Baltimore to see her famous, old, her famous younger brother, who was maybe three years old. Uh, her name was Eliza Mitchell. She had purchased her freedom. Interesting story. She'd had, I forget, seven or eight children. She had named one of them for Frederick Douglass, named him Frederick Douglass Mitchell. She meets him at the front door of that church Hello, Frederick, I'm your sister a lot. He hadn't seen her since 1836. He grabbed her arm in arm. They walked up the main aisle of that church. The 
press tell us that it's a falcon. The falcon was surrounded by American flags. And he got up and he told the story of Noah's Ark. That was when in doubt, always went to the Old Testament for a tried and true metaphor or story. And he said, uh, he told the story of, of you know, Noah's Ark stopped finally after whatever it was, months of years of the flood. And uh, Noah sent a dove out of the ark. And the dove came back with an olive branch in its beak, evidence that something was growing. So Noah sent the uh, dove out again, and the dove did not return. So Noah wondered, maybe it's over. He took the tarp off. And lo, says Noah, the world had been reborn. Douglas's interpretation of the re-election of Lincoln, meaning now the true possibility of prosecuting the war to the end and, and truly destroying slavery, and then his own return to, to the soil of Maryland. He went to the oldest rebirth metaphor in Western civilization, Noah's Ark. But he didn't just stop there. He says, today that I am back on the soil of Maryland, I am the dove. I am the message. Now that takes chutzpah. <laughs> he had that self into the Noah's Ark story. And you know, wow. Uh, I'm, you didn't ask about that, but he cared about Maryland. He cared about Maryland, and he used it for all it was worth, even though the referendum only passed by like 400 votes. Well, let's hear another question, Maryland related or, or not. Uh, and I won't tell any more Old Testament stories, I promise. Uh, yeah, let me stand up so you can hear me. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. Okay. If, if your principles are the first principles of the Declaration of Independence, those four great first principles that Jefferson borrowed from others but made his own, yes. Or the Bill of Rights, the creed of the founding, yes. But what it needed is a new constitution, a new structure, a, an entirely new regime of inclusion. And I'll say this too. One of the biggest themes in, in my book, uh, the five or six main themes, one that I kind of weave throughout, or try to be weave through, uh, throughout, is what happens to this old radical abolitionist, this old radical outsider, always on the outside, knocking on the door, attacking his country, criticizing his country, demanding to live up to his creed, like in the, the great Fourth of July speech of 1852. But what happened to that old radical outsider when his cause wins, and his cause did win. Make no mistake, the Civil War was a victory in the destruction of slavery and the preservation of the Union. But he, he goes on, of course, to live 30 more years, and he becomes an insider in the Republican Party. He becomes a bureaucrat in the federal government. Uh, he gets three, four appointments by the Republican president because and, and, that, and that causes all kinds of new ambivalences and all kinds of possible compromises and all kinds of rivalries with others and all kinds of claims that maybe he fell out of touch. But what Douglas believed, and he wouldn't give up this belief no matter what happened in the 30 years after the war, is that the Civil War had destroyed the first American nation and it had invented a new one. In the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments, first Civil Rights Act in 1866 and the Reconstruction Act and the obligation of his generation, he believed, was to preserve that recreation. And that's where you need to go back and read Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Amendment, the Birthright Citizenship Amendment, the Due Process Amendment. Section one of the 14th Amendment is the Constitution you, you and I live under right now. It says equality before law, because it had to be enforced. Douglas saw that as, a, as the new sacred founding, a new sacred creed. 15th Amendment, the Voting Rights Amendment, compromises all over it, it didn't go as far as it should have. Douglas didn't like it at first, but then what does Douglas do after the 15th Amendment? He goes back to Baltimore again. 
He marched in a big parade in Baltimore to celebrate the 15th Amendment. He made a big speech about it. He, he thought they had experienced, out of this Armageddon bloodbath, a re-founding. And he liked to sort of think of himself as a, a new founding father, even though he'd never held elective office. He didn't get to sign the 14th Amendment. Uh, he wasn't in a legislature. They got to vote for it. The, principle, the old principles were fine, but they needed a lot of refashioning, and they needed a new constitution to protect them. We've probably got time for one more question from the audience, and of course, uh, Jane. It's with you. <laughs> so, I want to shake your hand, because your hand shook. <laughs> so we are not, we are not that far away, especially here on the Eastern Shore. I'm sorry, James and Carol, but I had to. Had to well, it reminds me when Douglas met Thomas Clarkson in London, the great British abolitionist who was practically on his deathbed. He's in London, 1846. He gets to meet Thomas Clarkson, and he said, "I shook his hand." It felt like I was shaking the hand of British abolitionism and the 18th century. <laughs> anyway, uh, great question, sir. It's a fair question. Why do you need to stay in England? Well, there are many answers to that. He actually considered it. There were British abolitionist friends of his who encouraged him and were ready to help make that possible by the fundraising they were doing on his behalf. Uh, some other, some British abolitionists, particularly the Richardson sisters of Newcastle in England, led a campaign to raise the money to purchase his freedom. He stole fugitive slaves. Spent nine years legally a fugitive slave, susceptible to return to slavery. But he had his family back here. He had Anna. He had four, three children already born. And there will be a fourth on the way. Actually, no, I'm sorry, there are four children already born. The fifth one, Annie, will be born after he comes back. Um, he, had, he had a family back here. He had a cause back here. That may seem like a, a cliche, but that he had to come back because this is where his cause was. But that's exactly what he said. But don't think he didn't flirt with it. He got treated like a, like a hero. My God, in Scotland, they, 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 they wrote songs about him. He'd go into little towns to speak in Scotland, and children would meet him singing a song about Frederick Douglass. Man, that's, that's heady. <laughs> Home. Uh, he, he, he spoke to huge audiences in grand halls all over Ireland, Scotland, and England. He made very important friendships that he will keep the rest of his life in Britain. But his cause was that slavery was here. And, uh, but he only returned. He only finally returned. And he got very homesick at times. Very brutally lonely left from England. At one point, he writes a really lonely letter in the dead winter. He was in London. And he says he just walked down the street to a music shop and bought a violin. <laughs> when he started playing the violin, he wasn't any good at it. At first, he didn't know how. Later, he got a few lessons. He got better at it. But he only came back when it was secure that the All Brothers had agreed to his purchase of his, his owners back here uh, for $766,000. That doesn't seem like a lot of money today, but it was deep, deep money. And then he wouldn't leave again until he had the, the actual document with his three papers. And he got on the ship to Liverpool and came home. And he dearly wanted to get back. He's a young man with a family. And one of my favorite letters in all of the thousands of Douglas letters is a letter he writes back to one of his English friends who had helped facilitate so many things for him, describing getting off that boat in Boston, leaping off the boat, he says. There was a whole group of people there to meet him. He ran right by them. He didn't care to even say, hi. Ran right by him, got on the train immediately up to Lynn, which take, took about 20 minutes. And he describes in the letter, he says, I even left my trunk behind. He describes in the letter seeing 
Anna with the children out of the window of the train waiting for him. And how he couldn't wait to leap off the train to see them. That's the impulse that brought him back. It's a, it's a human impulse. It's his family. Uh, I will ask you this one last question, which I Good. hope maybe touches on something that other people here are curious about. So, you were here, the second, your second visit was in 2008 when I was here, and it was in the spring of 2008, and you mentioned that you had just gotten a contract with Simon & Schuster to write a biography of Frederick Douglass. I did? Oh. Yep. And I remember this, Can't I remember exactly where we were having it because what? something inside me died, and I said, I'm going to write a biography of oh, Frederick Douglass. Oh, sorry. And now no one would ever read it because David played it. No, that's beside the point. No, but my point being, so it was, so I remember exactly where it was, but um, I wish I'd written your age in '61. No, no, no. But um, but anyway, we were we were there in the custom house, and, and George Bush was president at the time. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started you started this book with Bush as president. Um, right. You did a lot of it, I assume, with Obama as president, unless you wrote it all the night before, like yeah. some of our students do, but probably not. Right. Um, and then you finished it with the guy. Never pulled an all-nighter. Never pulled, no. Yeah, not really. Um, seriously, though, how, how did that history unfolding around you inform the way you wrote the book? And also, how did what you were learning inform how you assessed the history? Because we know that, especially with, with Civil War and racial history, historians are, it's always the present and past doing a tug of war inside your brain, isn't it? Past and present are always colliding in the field we're in, or in many fields, most fields. Past is always in our present, and our present is always in our past. I, I don't know for sure the answer to that. I do know a lot of the sesquicentennial Civil War events had great impact on us, uh, as it has on all of us. There were so many conferences and events and panels that we were all on. The Civil War sesquicentennial year. 2011 to 15, and I'll never forget as long as I live, uh, the last big conference I was at, most of us were at, was in Charleston, um, April of 2015, and uh, it was a great conference, a bunch of school historians, great audience, and a big auditorium in Charleston, but the day after the conference on Sunday, we held a commemoration Charleston is all Hampton Park, this big park that sits next to the Citadel, the Military Academy of South Carolina. We had put a plaque there uh, five, six years before that, commemorating the first Memorial Day, which I had the blind great good luck to discover back in the early or late 90s and wrote about in the book Raising the Union. Long story made short, the uh, Confederates had converted the planter's race course, the horse track, uh, which was then called the Washington Race Course, into an open air prison in the last year of the war. About 260 Union soldiers had died there of disease and exposure, were thrown into a mass grave there in the grandstand. I won't go into how I found this in an archive, but they held a celebration or a commemoration on May 1st. 10,000 people marching around the old racetrack, led by black women, then by black men, then by Union, the contingents of Union soldiers, as many as could fit, fit into the burial ground where the black folk of Charleston had reinterred all of those dead properly in graves and written an inscription over the archway into it that said, Martyrs of the Race Corps. Uh, and that's the first memorial created by African Americans. Anyway, fast forward to 2015. They decided to hold the 150th anniversary of that moment out at Hampton Park, where the plaque was. And they built a little stage there. They had the Citadel Choir. It was a nice audience. There were only two speakers. I was asked to just take 10 minutes and tell this little story. But the other speaker was Clementa Pinckney, mm -hmm. who was the head preacher, head minister of Emanuel AME Church. 
big, tall, beautiful man with a great baritone voice. He gave an 11 minute homily. And that was uh, right after the shooting. That was no, no, that was before the Buffalo shooting. So it was two months before the shooting. He gave a homily at the Second Samuel about civil war, brother against father. The great story of Absalom in the Old Testament. Anyway, again, a long story made short. That day, I sat next to the Reverend Pinkman. We, uh, we used the same program to sing the hymns. Uh, two months later, I was at home on that night when the massacre of Emmanuel Amy happened. And I didn't hear all the names exactly who'd been shot until the next morning, someone emailed me and said that was uh, Commander Pinkman. I said, oh my God. And I quickly got on an email with my friends in Charleston. I said, Did you, do you think anybody would have videotaped that ceremony we did? I got I to gotta know exactly what Pinkman said that day. I could remember his speech a little bit, but I couldn't remember the details. Sure enough, like everything we do, we got videotaped. Within an hour, So you asked about how this period of our history was, I don't know how that affected me, except that it was devastating, it was profound, it made all of us in this field of Civil War history and now American history and slavery history suddenly in constant demand to try to explain to the press, to our country, to our students, why don't Americans ever get over this? Why do we still murder people over the Civil War? Why does it take a mass murder in the basement of a black church to get this country to talk about Confederate monuments? And here I was trying to write the last 10 chapters of my brother's biography. And I thought, yeah, maybe this book has a purpose after all. <laughs> but other than that, I don't know specific ways uh, this era. Obama was inspiring. I'll admit that, for God's sake. And if you've read the book, you know I'd be dinner. Because Obama's speech at the dedication of the new African American History Museum in Washington. Because he could have named anybody in the first paragraph of that speech, but he named Douglas right up front. He said, We see our history through the lens of the Lehman Gate of Frederick Douglass. And I don't know that I saw it on TV or I just looked it up. I wanted to know what Obama might have said. And Bingo, that's how I typed my book. Uh, anyway. Well, you have written something that's absolutely magnificent and um, beautiful, and, and I think all of us um, here should thank you for what you've done, David, and thank you for being here with us. Adam, thank today. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.